Um, so today we're gonna give you a practical on phylogenomics and it's me and Arthur here. Um, what is my... Yes, so we're basically gonna go again through some basic concepts and I'm pretty sure that Sebastian has already gone through them but never, um, it's never bad to actually have a refresh. And um, then we're gonna do uh, where do we start when we want to build a phylogenetic tree, which will be your DNA sequence alignment. And then we're gonna see different ways of building phylogenetic methods. Um, some that are distance-based and some that are character-based. And then we have a little bit of an outlook. So for this um, session, you will find the data in this path. So in your volume, volume and 5P phylogenomics. And if I show you this in the VM, let's see, this will be, volume, You can type the path there and it will take you there. And then you should see exactly these two files. So we, will ha we already provide you with a SNP alignment and then with a file that contains some sample ages. Um, I would recommend that you use this location to store all your trees and also all the results that we're gonna produce during the practical session. And I also would like you that if you open the terminal and please activate the in this Conda environment we will contain all the tools that we're going to be using in this session as well as in the session this afternoon. So if we do that together, you will open your terminal. Can I hide this? So you can open your terminal. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. So if I do conda activate, how was it called? So if you do, if you will run this command, it should activate your conda environment with all the programs and when people have reached here um, raise your hands or put thumbs up and if someone has problems just let us know and then we can try to fix them I said hands up or thumbs up. I think should be fine. If you have problems, please write it on the chat. I think that was most of you, no? Okay, so um, I'll leave you both the path and how to activate your con environment in the chat. And since I'm gonna be talking about environmental name not fun. How do we solve that, James? It's so, um, oh. <laughs> So if you write that and then this is where the data is found. Data found in all right. So let's see some basic concepts in phylogenomics. So I'm pretty sure Sebastian went through it, but basically phylogenetics is the branch of biology that deals with phylogeny and especially with the deduction of the historical relationship between groups of organisms. This is how it's defined in the Oxford dictionaries, but basically what it's showing you 
it's the relationship between organisms. And these are inferred based on sets of homologous characters. And these homologous characters must be inherited from a common ancestor. And we can use either morphological traits, like this is uh, done a lot in paleo paleo paleontology, uh, or you can actually use molecular characters, which what we are doing here, for example, with DNA, but you could also use RNA or uh, protein sequences. And the evolution, these evolutionary relationships are then being represented in a phylogenetic tree. And here in this diagram is actually one, the, the, one of the phylogenetic trees drawn by Darwin of how he interpreted. So we will see now what the different parts of the tree you have um, and what information they give you. So we have a, a phylogenetic tree here and we have what it's called tips or labels at the end. So these A, B, C, D, and E, and these are basically your sampled individuals. So these are the individuals that you have um, data from. Then we have nodes, which are marked in the diagram with circles, orange circles here, which basically are representing the ancestor share by one or more tips. Like for example, in this one, this is the ancestor share between A and B. But if we go to a deeper node, like in here, we are having the ancestor of A, B, C, and D. So um, you, you can have different ancestors that in the structure of the tree and they are all represented by nodes. And then we have branches and these connect each node to another node, for example, like in here, or a node with a tip. And they represent the evolutionary paths between the nodes and the leaves. And then we have the concept of branch length. And this is basically how long this branch is. And this can represent different things. It can represent the number of changes, the genetic or evolutionary distance, or simply at the time between um, the two taxa or nodes. Like this is, what, for example, what we will see in a time tree. We will see the time we won't be seeing the genetic distance. And then there is also different types of tree. We can have ultrametic trees and non-ultrametic trees. And as you can see, in ultrametic trees, all the leaves are aligned. So they have all the same distance to the root. And this is what you expect to observe when you have um, a constant evolutionary rate. So you should have that everything is the same, which as probably you have heard in Sebastian's um, uh, presentation, this is not the case on may, maybe saying even it's almost never the case. So there's always going to be some variation. And when this is happening, we will see what is a non ultrametic tree um, where we see that each leaf has a different distance to the root. But how do you then, how do you get from your data to having a tree and the star usually from a phylogenetic analysis is from your DNA sequence alignment. And what we want to compare, as I said, are homologous genomic positions. So these are positions that are being inherited um, by the same ancestor. And also because we assume that they are, if they are inherited from the same ancestor, they should um, behave similarly um, and for that we need to align the dna sequence and this can be generated in different ways depending on your data you could do a multiple sequence alignment of complete genomes um, which it can be attainable with small, uh, smaller genomes um, and there is here i left you some programs that can be used for this like MAF or cluster omega or you can use a reference to make a reference-based alignment in which you will, if you align your reads, you know that all the reads have come from all the samples have come from the same position. And you actually saw how to do this in the practical way of genome mapping with multi-VCF analyzer. Um, also a little note for large genomic data sets, we often use a single nucleotide polymorphism like SNP alignment. So what you saw yesterday um, and more often that we also use the ones that contain only variable genomic positions. And this is more for making it computationally possible to analyze the data. Um, so since you already knew how to produce a SNP alignment in the practical 4B, we now want to explore with you a bit um, how this alignment looks like 
by open it in mega so if you guys open the application finder here with this um magnifying glass and then type mega it will you should uh, the mega window should open and it should look something like this so if you reach there please put your thumbs up or hand up so i can see that you're reaching there great Perfect. So I think that's almost everyone. So let's open then our SNP alignment. So you will go to file and then open a file session and you will select this um, SNP alignment that we have um, made for you. And when you are done, Again, put your thumbs up or your hand up. And if you have any problem, please just write it on the chat and we'll try to solve it. When you've done that, you should see um, this window. Okay, some hands are going now. My son's growing up and will it be useful if I put the previous slide again? Um, if you think so, please write yes on the chat. Okay, so is everyone now set up? If you haven't, um, if you are not seeing this uh, window, please write it on the chat. Okay, it seems that everyone is here. So in this input window, it's asking you which sort of data you have. Um, so if it's nucleotide, protein, or pairwise insects, and in our case, we have nucleotide sequences, this should be already selected. And then it's asking you a different ways of encoding with the data. So for us, uh, we want to encode missing data with an N, so you should change that. And the rest, we will leave it like it is. Um, and then you will press OK. And it will ask you if this is a protein encoding sequence, and we will say no because we have only SNP um, variable SNP, so we don't have any encoding of proteins in it. And when you are done, again, thumbs up. So I can see if people are reaching the perfect. Great. Um, so now what you will see is this, and we are we're opening the alignment. You just have to press in this TA box. And what you will see is this. Are people seeing this? Could you please do thumbs up if you are seeing it? Okay. So basically we have here an alignment 
So each of the columns in here are representing a, a position, a one SNP, and then we have the different uh, genomes each in its row in this table. So we have three samples of interest in this practical, and these are the first top three here. And these are uh, genomes from Y pestis that are dating between 5,000 to 2,000 years ago. Um, and then I have a few questions that you could uh, please answer in the chat. So what do you think that the dots are representing in this alignment? Fail to load HTML option dialog. Have you seen that error before? Okay. Yeah, but people are guessing right. So these are actually the dots represent positions that are not variable between the samples. Um, so I think Laura was having a problem and I'm not so... Yeah, James will help you if you could please go to the space in the bottom and then he will try to find out why there is some stream write error. So yeah, so we have our dots which represent um, uh, SNPs that are not uh, that are equal to the to the reference, and then we have also n. So if you remember what we did at the beginning when we put it the input, what do you think these are representing? Not quite, they are not mass positions. Yeah, that's the right answer. So what we are seeing here is positions where we don't have information for, so missing positions. And as you can see in our ancient genomes, there is some positions that most of them um, have ends. And these usually are positions where we have problems performing a mapping for whatever reason, or that they are not present in those genomes at all. Um, and then the last question that I have for you guys is how many sequences are you analyzing? If you could write it on the chat. Yeah, great. So yeah, you have 34 sequences um, that we will be analyzing. And I'm going to talk a bit about distant based phylogenetic methods. So in these methods, we are calculating the tree from a pairwise distance. This pairwise can be calculated in different ways. So it can be the number of differences between two genomes, or it can be the number of difference divided by the total size, which is what we call the p-distance. Um, and then with this, we can actually do some calculations. So we can see how different the two genomes are, and there is different um, algorithms for trying to define a tree. What is also important to keep in mind is that there is different substitution models. Um, and I think Sebastian went through quite extensively through them. So I'm just left here some explanations that you can look at your own time. But basically these allow you to model how, how you allow different uh, nucleotides um, to, to mutate through time. So it, it allows you to recreate how this um, SNP alignment happened, and this will also vary the number of, of distance and also in a more, in more complex um, models that um, Artur is gonna present, they can help to actually define a bit better the branches. Um, yeah, so basically, yeah, it will give every type of mutation a different probability to occur. And now we can actually, in MEGA, you can calculate this pairwise distance matrix. So if you go to this symbol here, you can click on compute pairwise distances. And you will see that it appeared that you will have a pairwise um, distance. Maybe I can show it in the BM, which I don't know why it's not here now. OK, 
So if you have click here and then compute pairwise distance, you will say yes, and you will leave everything the same. And then you will see exactly a matrix um, where you can see how distance one genome is from another. So as you can see, um, there is no distance calculated in the diagonal, and this is because this is the genome to, its, to itself. And then you can see how much they vary, like what is the distance between the second genome and the first genome, and so on. But you don't have to worry about this. I just wanted to show you that this is how it's calculated and how the data looks like. But actually, the algorithm is going to use this data to perform the tree. And we can use, so one of these um, algorithms that uses this pairwise distance algorithm is the I, I matrix is the neighbor joining tree. And here we have, we have an example of a matrix. And basically um, what it tries to do is to see which are the two, which are the closest genomes. So in this case, in the first one, I'm not like there is the, all the math that you can do here, and that's what the program is doing behind. But I'm not gonna go through each of the steps. Um, you can look at your own time and ask me questions if you have. But basically, what the program is to try to do is to find which are the ones that are closest to each other, and then it groups them together, and then it, at the end, we will have the relationship between the the to all the genomes and which ones are closest to which ones. Um, but we can actually compute that uh, with MEGA. So if you go to phylogeny, which is here. So if you're clicking here, and now we're going to say construct a neighbor joining tree. And then you will say, yes, I want to use the data right now. I think we didn't need to change anything. Yeah, so the method should be a p distance, which is what already we have here, and then we're gonna leave the rest the same. And if you do that, you're gonna have a tree. Unfortunately, Mega doesn't work very well in this VM, and you cannot see the name of the tips. So, um, if you have reached until here, I, I would like that you put thumbs up, and then we can see how we can actually visualize this tree. Okay, seems that everyone has reached. So now what we basically are gonna do is we're gonna export our tree um, within Mega. So I maybe you go to file, save current tree as new week. Then you will see this other window. Then you can click on branch length, okay. And then another window will appear, and then you can click on save, and I will name it ng3.newik. So I can do it now with you. So if you go to file, you say export current tree as newik. I want it to have branch lengths, and then I click on OK. Then I have this file editor where you cannot see anything, but there is actually data in it. As you can see here, um, and then you can do file, save or save us. I think it doesn't matter which one you press. And now I'm just gonna call it. And we, I'm saving it in the volume, volume, vol, volume, uh, 5P phylogenomics, so we can keep all our data uh, tidy and we can find it later on. Okay, and then if you click save, it should have been saved. Did everyone manage to save the tree? Could you do thumbs up if you manage? Sorry, I missed the step of uh, exporting or 
Uh, someone is talking. Am I the one that is hearing or? So was someone saying something? Yes. Yeah. I can write it instead if that's easier. I know, I can hear you now. Okay, no, I missed the step where I export the tree. Okay, so you will have, you will be here. Yeah. You will click on file and then export current tree as new week. And if you press here, you should see this window. Yeah. You click on branch length because we want that it actually has the proper branch length. And then we click on OK. And you will have this window editor, which it seems that it doesn't contain anything, but it's just a visualization of, of the, v and the VM of Mega. Um, and then you can just do file, save, and then whatever you want. I, I would recommend you to name it new neighbor joining tree. So NG stands for neighbor joining a short. And then you okay. can just save it. Yeah. All right. So I think it's anyone else having any problem? If not, we will then um, continue. And we uh, a way of exploring trees um, it can be used using fig tree. So if you go to your terminal and actually type fig tree, then it should open up. And then you can also open your tree by doing file open um, neighbor joining tree in a week. And I'll go through it like you would do. So you will open your terminal, type fig tree. Well, this one where I have actually, remember that you have to have your conda environment activated, if not, it's not going to work as you saw me doing. If you do that, um, you should, this window should appear. So this is Fig Tree, is a program that allows you to visualize tree and modify them. It's a quite nice. I use it a lot. And then you go to open. Mm -hmm. I don't remember how it was called. Oh no, I don't think not the one. You see, we also make mistakes. Doesn't matter how long you have you been working with this data. Um, and then you go open your uh, neighbor joining tree. You do okay, and then you will see a tree. If you reach here, um, thumbs up so I can know that people. Okay. Great. So we have this tree. Um, so uh, the first question I will have for you is which type of tree it is. Of course, it's a neighbor joining tree, but I'm talking more about the structure of the tree. And if I give you maybe a hint, if you there is also another type of trees, and these are rooted versus unrooted trees. So unrooted trees are representing the, the relationships, but you don't really know in which uh, order they follow in time. So you don't know in this case, in this tree, if outgroup is close to gorilla or if outgroup is, is close to human or if outgroup is close to chimpanzee. While rooted trees, uh, we use an outgroup. So we know that this species is definitely outside of, like it represents an ancestor of all the other species uh, to basically tell the program, okay, this is where the root is. And now um, we know that gorilla is, is ancestors to chimpanzee and then chimpanzee and human are together. So if you're looking at the tree, which sort of tree do you think it is? Oh, there is a mix of opinions. And some people say rooted, some people say unrooted. And actually in our case, even though that you are seeing a root, it's an unrooted tree. So the, the, we, there was no information that we gave to the program to tell it which one was the outgroup. But we actually know that Yersinia pseudotuberculosis is the outgroup, so we can use it to root our tree. 
And what you will do is select the wipe sudo um, branch, and then you will press on the reroot here. So if I do it with you, you will go to web sudo and do a reroute. And now we can actually see the real structure of the tree. So you can see that wipe sudo has, is quite um, ancestor to wipe sudo, to, uh, to wipe pestis here, which are of all of our other genomes. So you can see that actually by rooting the tree, our tree structure change a bit. Um, and it's very important that you have this in mind when you are working with trees, if you have an outgroup to root your tree properly. Okay. So that, did people manage to root the tree? So I see some thumbs up. Perfect. Great. Okay, so no more questions for you guys. So how many leaves or tips does our tree have? Yeah, that's right. We have 34, which are the number of sequences that we actually put in the tree. Do you think that this tree is ultrametric? That's right. We have actually here that the branches are not the same um, length. So we have a non ultrametric tree. And in this case, these branches are representing distance between the genomes. Um, then, as I told you, we had some genomes of interest in our um, alignment, which are the ones that we want to characterize. And these are these ones here. So where are these taxa? Where are they falling? in the tree. Okay, so that's true. They are falling basal to our, all of the other diversity of white pests here. Do you think that they form a clade? Yes, that's right. They form a clade. And if you know which sort of type of clade there is, do you know which type of clade they are forming? Okay, so maybe I give you a bit of background. So there is different types of clades in a phylogenetic tree. There is what we know as a monophyletic clade. So these are a group of taxa that contain all the taxa that share a common ancestor. So for example, in this tree, one of the possible monophyletic clades are B, C, and D. If you select all of them together, they are forming a monophyletic clade. There is also what is known as a paraphyletic clade, which contains all the taxa in a group except for one or more taxa. So in this example, if now we only selected the tips B, C, and D, we are gonna have a paraphyletic clade because we are not, um, including A. So this will be a paraphyletic clade. And a polyphyletic clade, it's a group of taxa from different monophyletic clades. Like in our case, if we selected B and C, now we are having a polyphyletic clade because we have two taxa from different monophyletic clades and we are not including the rest. So as people have already uh, writing in the chat, what we have half is a monophyletic clade of this taxa, and they are falling ancestor to all the rest of the um, white pestis tree. So I think you have discovered that you have a new clade, and it's actually only formed by these genomes, and if I, these were ancient genomes as we talked, so now we have discovered an undocumented, previously unknown clade in the white pestis phylogeny. So this is to display you what you can learn from the, this tree. And now Arthur is gonna introduce you to a more complex um, ways and algorithms to um, compute trees based on the characters themselves, not just distances. And don't be confused, he's gonna be talking from my window. <laughs> but technical reasons. Okay. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, so where, where's the virtual machine? You have it here. Yeah. yeah. Just, Yes, so I had just showed you how to 
reconstruct a phylogenetic tree based on distance-based uh, methods, and which have the advantage to be usually really fast uh, methods, but they are also kind of inaccurate in a way that they don't use the true information that you have in your data. And so what we, we tend to use instead uh, are what we call character-based uh, methods. And those methods, instead of simply looking at basically pairwise distances between uh, genomes, they will use models uh, that will reconstruct the full evolution of each of the characters. So in, in this case, uh, each of the DNA uh, nucleotides in the alignment along uh, the phylogenetic tree. So one of these methods is uh, called maximum uh, parsimony. You might have heard of that already. And it consists basically simply at, of looking at all uh, possible trees that you can make and then reconstruct the ancestral, ancestral states for each uh, of the nucleotides and then all the substitutions along the tree and then select the tree that in, involves uh, the least number of substitutions. So for instance, if we have uh, this very simple alignment here, which is composed of only one uh, genomic position for uh, five uh, genomes, let's say, and you have uh, those two trees and you want to ask which one is the most parsimonious, uh, which one would it be? Do you think you can tell me in the chat? Left. So someone is saying left. Yeah. So more people are saying right, and indeed the right tree, the tree on the right, is the most uh, parsimonious. So we are not going to kind of go through the, all the possible uh, evolutionary histories, but it's pretty clear that in any case, uh, the most parsimonious explanation involves to have a G as the most ancestral uh, state for the, for the nucleotide. And then the tree on the left would involve two substitutions from G to T to explain the data, while the second tree on the right involves only one uh, substitution. So in, in this case, the tree on the right is the most parsimonious uh, tree. Okay. So we're go not going to build a maximum parsimony uh, tree today. And this is partly because this method, I think there's a bit of a debate about that, but I think it's a bit uh, outdated. Uh, uh, but yeah, you, you, you can do so using different uh, softwares, like uh, you can do it in Mega actually, but uh, you have other possibilities. Uh, but instead, uh, what we will uh, be... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can I interrupt one second? Um, for the parsimony tree, it's a very useful method still if you have like a yes or no um, like um, information. Like for example, with um, how to say like uh, like um, traits, like physical traits, or like you have bones and the certain part of the bone is present or not. So you have basically a matrix of zeros and ones. This uh, maximum parsimony is a very yeah. useful method to implement. It should be useful and depending use... on the type of data and exactly. binary data for which is, it can be difficult to compute, for instance, uh, substitution rates can still be uh, useful. Yeah. But yeah, when we have DNA data, what we tend to use uh, mostly nowadays is what we call probabilistic uh, methods. And I think probably uh, so Sebastian covered that already, but we're going to go through that quickly again. So uh, probabilistic methods uh, in general, they are statistical techniques that use probabilit probabilistic models, which are stochastic models under which the data is generated following a probability distribution that depends on a set of parameters that uh, we want to estimate, basically. So the concept of a probabilistic, probabilistic model is uh, represented uh, with this little uh, graph on the right. So you have data, this is what we know, this, this is what we can uh, observe. And then you have a model with uh, parameters that we don't know, but that we want to estimate. And then in between you have a, a probabilistic relationship that gives you the probability of the data 
given certain values of the parameter. And so this is a probability, this is a single uh, value that goes between zero and one, and that we call the likelihood, this probability of the data given the parameters. So this is the, the, the simple shape, a general shape of a probabilistic uh, model. And so now if we want to build a probabilistic phylogenetic model, what we want to ask first is what should be the data and what should be uh, the parameters. So maybe if you have a clue, you can uh, tell me in the chat, what should be the data for a phylogenetic model and what should be uh, the parameters in this model? I guess at least the data, you should be able to, to guess what it should be. Okay. Yes, indeed. So the data is what we know, what we observe, and that's the DNA sequences, so our DNA alignment. And what should be the parameters? So the parameters, as are what we want to estimate from uh, the sequences then. Like what is the main purpose of a phylogenetic uh, model? Substitutions, indeed, and, and also most importantly the tree itself so the tree itself is a, is a model is a parameter of the model so this is the shape of a probabilistic phylogenetic model you have the data which consists of uh, sequence alignments in our case you have then two let's say mega parameters in the model the first one is the substitution matrix which gives you the different substitution rates and then the composition of this matrix will depend on the substitution model that you use, as uh, I've explained before. And then you have the tree itself, which is actually the main parameter that we wish to estimate, and which is indeed a complex param parameter, but still a parameter of the model. And uh, yeah, so this is the, the, the general composition of this uh, model. And uh, one Basically, I, I won't go into details now, but there is one uh, probabilistic phylogenetic uh, model that is used by virtually all methods, which is called the continuous time Markov chain model or the Felsenstein model. And that allows you to give this probability of sequence data depending on a substitution matrix and a given tree. And so, yeah, if you want to know more about that and understand a bit more how uh, that works, I really re recommend this read, uh, which is uh, yeah, a really good read and also very accessible to, to non-mathematicians. Okay, so now we have uh, our model and now the question is, how do we use it to actually make inference? So actually deduct the parameters that we want to estimate. So how do we use uh, this model to find the parameters that fit best our data given that model. And one typical uh, method of inference for prob probabilistic models is called maximum likelihood. I'm sure you've heard of that already. And it simply consists of calculating the likelihood, so this probability given all possible parameter values, in that case would be all possible uh, values for the rates and all possible trees, and then selecting the set of parameters that maximizes uh, this likelihood. So I think that's pretty intuitive and pretty uh, simple in principle. But of course, in the real world, when you have a lot of uh, parameters and also parameters get, that can be on an infinite space or very complex, like trees, it's basically impossible to search in the complete space of parameters. So what we use instead are clever heuristic algorithm that will try to uh, approximate uh, this maximum by basically computing the likelihood, changing a bit the, the values of the parameter iteratively until they uh, find this peak. Okay, so this is how it works. Maximum uh, likelihood phylogenetic inference. 
No, I just want to give you a few words about, uh, yeah, that's true, about uh, bootstrapping. So the, the maximum likelihood, likelihood estimate is a point estimate. That means it's a single uh, value for the parameters that we judge is the best, are the best uh, values, the best fitting values. And so in that case, it would give you a single tree and a single value for all the substitution rate. So what we miss is a measure of uncertainty. Basically, the maximum likelihood estimate won't give you something like a confidence uh, interval, for instance. And so what we can use to measure that uncertainty is a method called uh, bootstrapping, which basically consists uh, in taking your original alignment and then masking randomly some positions several times. And then from each of these bootstrap alignments, estimate a maximum likelihood tree, which we will uh, call bootstrap trees. And then what you measure is that you look in your ML tree at each of the clades, and for each of the clades, you will compute the proportion of the bootstrap trees that contain that clade, and this value, we call it the bootstrap support, and it gives you a, a, some kind of idea of the robustness of uh, the clade. Basically, if this value is very high, it means that uh, your data supports uh, very strongly this clade, because if, even if you disturb the data set, you still cannot uh, recover it anyways. And if it's very low, it means that it's not a very robust, uh, robustly uh, estimated claim. So that's how uh, bootstrap uh, works. And it's actually some method for measuring uncertainty that, that you could apply to any inference method. So you could apply that same uh, method using maximum parsimony, for instance, or even a distance-based uh, method. Okay, so now we are going to try this. So we are going to try to estimate the maximum likelihood uh, tree from our alignment using a program that is called uh, RaxML. So using this common line here. So this is just the, the program name. Uh, this is the number of threads that we are going to use. This is the substitution model that we want to use. In that case, we'll, we will use a GTR, GTR plus gamma model. This uh, tells the software which algorithm we want to use. In that case, we want to make an ML estimation and bootstrapping. Those are just random seeds for the heuristic algorithm. This is also not so important in this case. This is uh, the, the input, so the, the SNP alignment, and this is a suffix for the, for the output. So basically, the, the, the program will output several files and will append this suffix to uh, each of them. So to do that, I recommend that you first change, uh, you go into your terminal and you change location to go to uh, the, the working directory where the data is located. Maybe I can copy paste that. Yeah, no. Another list. Come on, door control. No, that is not what yeah, we are. Only what it's not. Okay. But in here you can do copies. Mm. Yeah, and now you have to do. Okay. And can I send something in the chat? No. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, I, I would advise you to, to change working directory before you run the, the command. So I just put the, the command to change working directory in, in the chat. And then you can run the, the command line that is on the slide. I will also do it.
So that should take a few minutes, I guess. If you have questions in the meanwhile. Okay. Yeah, I, I can copy paste also the comment in chat. Okay, is it working for everyone? Can you come back if this is the case? Many people so far. Do you have issues running the command? Yes. If someone has issue, just let me know. So this is finished in my case. So it just takes a few minutes actually. So once it's done for you as well, you will open Fig Tree again, visualize the, the output, and then you will open the file that is called Raxml by partitions, blah, blah. Beware, don't try to open the one that is open by partitions branch length or something. I think there is one that is called like that. And then when you, you open that file, you will have to change. There, there'll be a prompt and uh, you'll have to change label to something like bootstrap uh, support. You don't have to type this exact like uh, word, but uh, yeah, it's good to change. It's basically the program wants to know what values what should be the name of the values that are annotated at the nodes? And in this case, they are bootstrap support. So maybe I can do it also. It's this file that you should open, not the bit, uh, by partitions branch labels. This one. And here we change to bootstrap support. Okay, once uh, this is done, you can, so it's a bit the same case as the neighbor joining tree that you constructed with IDA already. This ML uh, method is creating a substitution tree. So it read with uh, branch lengths that represent the number of genetic uh, changes. So it's not oriented in time, but it's just, you, you see it as a rooted tree that is oriented in time because fig tree basically uh, displays it uh, random with a random uh, root. But what we have to do first is to, like we already did previously, reroute the tree based on our prior prior knowledge that um, the old group is why pseudotuberculosis in our data set. So you do the same as before. You click on the white pseudo branch and then you click on uh, reroute in fig tree. So I can show you again how that works. So I just, the branch leading to web pseudo is here. It's this very long branch. So I click on it and then I can click on reroute at the top. Okay, so when you are done with that, please let me know. Maybe, yeah, just 
in the chat maybe. Thumbs up. Is anyone not done? Okay. Hey, sorry, can I? Yeah. Yeah, I think I got lost at some point. <laughs> okay. At which point? Uh, so I managed to run the script. Uh, but now when I open the fig tree, I it doesn't, even though I rebooted, it, it doesn't look like yours. So I think I missed a step somewhere. Okay. Did you open this, the good one? This one that is called uh, by partitions? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you, so uh, probably what you opened was the bootstrap trees or something like that. That must look different, most likely. Yeah. I'm sorry, I have such a small screen and I'm trying to do everything and I can't really see what I'm doing, but <laughs> now it looks good. Thanks. Okay, it's good now, cool. Uh, Marlene, it work for you also now? Okay, maybe we go on. So I guess most people you should have uh, that tree visual uh, like rooted correctly in that way. And we're going to ask the same question as before. Uh, where do our genomes of interest from the LNBA period place compared to the rest of the uh, Yersinapesis diversity? So here are again the names of these uh, genomes. Do we observe the same topology uh, as in the uh, NG tree? I mean in terms of the position of those uh, genomes. And in addition, we're going to check if that placement is well supported. And to do that, you're going to look at the bootstrap uh, support of that clade by clicking on uh, the node labels box at the left uh, hand of the tree window, and then ch uh, changing uh, node ages to bootstrap support in the drop down menu. And yeah, when you're done with that, you can basically try to answer those three questions in the chat.
Hmm? Okay, so when you are done, please let me know when, if you think that these genomes are placed in, in the same way as in the NJ tree and whether displacement is well supported. Okay, so maybe I can show you also the results. So I opened the tree in fig tree. I guess you can zoom a bit to check a bit better the placement. And you can see that it, indeed, again, those four genomes from uh, uh, the LNBA period they place as a monophyletic clade that is basal to the rest of uh, pestis diversity. And now if you display the bootstrap support, so you click on node labels and then you change node ages to bootstrap support or, or whatever you typed in the, the prompt when you open the file. What you can see is that, so it's not that easy to see actually, but the bootstrap report of that clade is the value that is associated to this node, which defines that clade, and it's 100%. So it's actually the placement of that clade basal to the rest of the Yersinia pestis diversity is highly supported with a bootstrap support value of 100%, so, so the maximum uh, value. So that means that we can be pretty confident of that placement. Okay. So what we're gonna do next is now do exactly the same thing, but this time removing the out group from the alignment. Because I don't know if you noticed, but when you have an out group that is uh, very distant from the rest of your uh, diversity, it makes it kind of uh, difficult to visualize because you have, you have this uh, very long branch and then it can kind of uh, contracts every, everything else. And also these long branches, they can cause problems for inference sometimes. So it's usually better to use uh, out groups that are closer to the diversity that we're looking at. So what you're going to do is reopen your alignment in MEGA when this is done, you have your list of uh, genomes and you will unclick the white pseudo genome in the alignment and export it in FASTA format with uh, a different name. So we can uh, call it SNP alignment without outgroup.fasta, for instance. So I can show you that also. So you open the alignment in MEGA like this, and then you have your list of genomes, and you will go to the bottom actually, 
and you will unclick wipe sudo and then data export data and here we change uh, the title so we could we can call it the same way for instance snip alignment we could call it the same way at the beginning and then we change the name to without out group but faster i don't know if we need to add the action actually but okay let's try and yes and don't forget to change the format to faster there should be faster somewhere okay Oh, but it has a name, the one that you want. Ah, yeah. Okay. So actually, the name you have to to set it at the very end when you when you actually save uh, when you choose the location of the file. It's inside that. And no, I don't want to view results okay so play please let me know when you're done with this also or if you have troubles doing so So is someone not done with that? That doesn't seem to be the case. OK. So once you have this new al alignment in which you removed the out group, you're going to run exactly the same command. But it, uh, of course, you need to change the input to yeah, whatever you named the file. Maybe I can put that in the chat again. I also put the command in the chat if you want to use that instead. I think I'll run that myself too. Quickly. So maybe you have to change the the name of the, the input if you made a typo like I did when exporting the alignment. But then it should work in the same way.
Yeah, you can let me know if you have troubles running that, or, or if you couldn't already output the, the new alignment. Okay, so when the program's uh, finished running, you are going to do just as before. Open it, open the bipartition tree in fig tree. And then this time you don't have white pseudo anymore to reroot the tree. So you'll have to do that based on your previous knowledge, basically on what we've learned from the previous uh, tree. So basically, you will have to look in the previous tree that you have rooted with the web pseudo, which branch uh, goes to the roots in this new tree, and then click on it in fig tree and click on reroute again. And yes, when you're done with this, please let me know again. Maybe I can add something, something here. I just had a little hint here to help you with this last step. Is it okay for everyone? Is someone having troubles? Okay, that doesn't seem to be the case, but I'll, so I'll show you what we should have done here. So again, open fig tree. And then open this new tree so in this case we change the suffix to without odd group and we want to open still this raxml by partitions uh, file we open it like that and change again that label value to extract support and then based on our previous results we know that this clade here that is composed of those uh, four LNBA genomes should be basal 
to the full diversity of wipe estes that we have now without uh, wipe pseudo. And so we know that we should reroute that tree based on the branch that that is just ancestral to that clay, basically. So we click on that branch here <clears throat> and we reroute the tree. And so that's how that's how it looks. And you can see that without the old group, you have much better visual resolution to see what's happening in that tree. Okay. So could everyone do that? Okay, once this is done, you're gonna actually save that tree which you have rooted by clicking on File, Export Trees, and then you have to click on a Save as Currently Displayed box, I think. So I can do it with you. So File, Export Trees, then you leave that as Nexus, and you just have to click on that save as currently displayed, just to save the tree uh, in this uh, rerouted form that you've uh, just created. Okay, and maybe we can give it a name like, we can call it ML tree rerouted, for instance. And dot nexus was it's a, it's gonna be saved in nexus format. Uh, no. Okay, anyway, okay, so we save it. Yeah, so no, you, it's, it's not that we selected the ancient genomes necessarily. It's, we selected them because we saw previously using an auto that they were placed basal to the tree. So to root correctly your tree, you should basically choose the branch that you know is the deepest in the tree. And sometimes you can know it because you, you have an old group that you know is the sister clay to the rest of the diversity that you have in hand. That, that was the case with the white pseudo. We knew in advance that the branch leading to white pseudo was the one that would that should go deeper in the tree, so that's why we could use it. And uh, in this case, we knew that the branch leading to, the, to those LNBA genomes uh, was the deepest branch in that new tree based on this uh, previous results in which we, sh we, we could show that uh, they, they were forming a clay that was basal to the rest of uh, white pestis diversity. Okay, I hope you all succeeded doing that. And I think we need to go on. Um, yeah, I'm gonna skip that for the moment. Let's see if we have time for that at the end. It's not the most important. What we're going to do now is try to estimate this time not a substitution tree, but a time tree. That means a tree in which the branches are not representing numbers of uh, substitutions, but time of evolution. And uh, to, do so, to do so, we will use a uh, we will use Bayesian inference instead of a maximum likelihood inference. So just a few words again on Bayesian inference. It's a different uh, inference approach, which instead of looking at the probability of the data given the parameters, so the likelihood, we look at 
we'll look at a, a different uh, probability, which is called the posterior probability, which is the probability of the parameters given the data, this time, so the opposite, and uh, which is a much more convenient uh, probability to work with, actually, because once you have estimated the, uh, the probability of uh, the parameters given the data, you have all the information all the information you need to uh, generate point estimates, but also to get an idea of the uncertainty of your estimates uh, on your parameters. So once you have uh, the posterior probability of the parameters, you can estimate, for instance, a median or a mean estimate, but you can also uh, directly compute this kind of uh, confidence intervals. So it's really convenient. The way we can uh, derive this posterior prob probability is using the Bayes uh, theorem, which says that the probability of the parameters given the data is proportional to the probability of the data given the parameters times the probability of the parameters. In other words, the posterior is proportional to the likelihood times what we call the prior distribution of the parameters. So that those are uh, probability distributions for the parameters that we will choose a priori, so without knowing, knowing anything from the data. Uh, so yes, so this is how it looks. Uh, let's say the conceptual uh, representation of a Bayesian model this, uh, this time. We have the same uh, elements as before. So the data, the parameters, and the likelihood that brings both of them. But now we, we have to add a new com component, which are the hyperparameters. And uh, prior uh, uh, probabilistic relationships that links the parameters and the hyperparameters, which is called the prior distribution. So these hyperparameters, they are not very important. Usually they are not something you try to estimate. They are just uh, parameters of the distribution that we want to use as a prior. So they can be, for instance, the mean and the standard deviation of a normal distribution, if you want to use a normal distribution for a given uh, parameter. Okay, so we have a new uh, model structure when we want to work with Bayesian inference, so we have to adapt our uh, phylogenetic model. So again, we still have the same components as before, so a sequence alignment as the data, a substitution matrix and a tree as the parameters. But we'll add a new parameter in this case because we want to esti estimate a uh, time tree, so a tree cali calibrated in time, uh, which we call the molecular clock, and which is simply the substitution rate in, in, um, in time units, uh, per time units, basically. So it gives you the amount of substitution that you should uh, expect in a given amount of time, basically. And then for each of, those, of these uh, parameters, we have prior distributions with a set of uh, hyperparameters hyper for each of the distributions that you don't really have to, to care about uh, at this point. Okay, so this is the structure of our Bayesian phylogenetic model. And then the question is, how do we use that again for inference? So with Bayesian inference, in opposite to maximum likelihood, we do not only want to estimate the maximum of the distribution, but we actually want to characterize the full posterior distribution of the parameters. And again, that, that's of course impossible when you have complex models. So we use a heuristic algorithm to approximate that distribution instead, which is called MCMC for Monte Carlo Markov chain. And this MCMC is basically a little robot that will walk along the space of parameters and will sample parameter values at a frequency that should be proportional uh, to the, the posterior probability of those parameters. So what it means essentially is that when you run that algorithm and you let it work uh, long enough and you take the, the parameter values that it has assembled along the way and you draw an histogram with those values, 
that should be a very good approximation of the, the, the posterior probability of your parameters. Okay, so that's the MCMC, that's about the inference. So now we have all, all the elements uh, we need uh, to run a, a Bayesian uh, phylogenetic model. And we're gonna do that using a, a software that is called BEAT2. And that is, that I, that's actually a, a set of softwares that allows to prepare different steps of that analysis. So first you have little uh, GUI software that is called Beauty that will allow to import the data and set up the analysis. With that, you will generate an XML file that will get into the main software, these two, that will run the analysis. And this will uh, output different uh, files with the parameter values, basically, that we will look into using tracer and uh, tree annotator for the, the tree sample. Okay, don't, don't hesitate to let me know if you have questions on the way. Okay, so we are gonna start uh, opening beauty. Maybe don't, don't do it right now, but when you, you will open uh, beauty, you, you will see different tabs that will allow you to set up the different components of that model that I just saw you. So the, the first tab is the partition tab in which we load uh, the data. The second tab is the tip dates tab in which you will constrain your tree parameter we have with the known uh, tip dates, with the known sample ages, basically, which must be in most cases supporting dating data, I guess. And that's actually necessary to be able to calibrate the molecular clock. Then you have a third tab, which is the site model, in which you will uh, decide on uh, basically the substitution model that you will use, so the shape of the substitution matrix. Then I think I forgot that slide, yeah, but there is also then a clock model uh, tab, which allows you to choose the molecular clock model that you wanna use, so we didn't cover that uh, here, but there are different ways to, to, to model a molecular clock. And then you have the prior tab in which you will set all those prior distributions and finally, the MCMC tab in which we set up this MCMC robot. So basically telling him how long you want him to walk and at which frequency you want him to sample uh, the parameters. So that's, it sounds a bit complicated, but it's actually, I'm sure you will get used to that pretty quickly. So what we'll do now is prepare a beast analysis in beauty. So you can open Beauty using the command line again. Let's just check that it works, but. Uh, okay, so don't install the new packages when you open Beauty. And then you will try to set up an analysis with the following uh, requirements. So load the alignment that you've prepared without the odd group in the partition tab. Then you will load the sample ages. So in the tip dates tab, I think I will show you how to do that. Then you will use a GTR substitution uh, matrix with a, a gamma site model and, uh, and four gamma categories in the site model tab. A relaxed clock log normal model in the clock model tab with an initial value of uh, 10 to the minus four. A Bayesian skyline coalescent tree prior in the prior tab and then you will change also in the, in the prior step the mean clock prior distribution to a uniform distribution between 10 to the minus 6 and 10 to the minus 3. 
And in the MCMC chain, you will ask for 300 million iterations and log the parameters and the trees each 10,000 iterations. And then you leave everything else as default. So maybe I show you how to do that now. And then I go back to the slide so you can have the instructions again. So you open Beauty. Could everyone open Beauty? Working. So in the partitions tab, you will click on file and then import alignments. And then you select the alignment without wipe pseudo, so without the odd, the odd group that we've uh, selected, that we've created just before. So you open that. Yeah, choose the data type. With, in, those are nucleotides indeed. So we just click on OK. And then you should see the alignment here. So the alignment uh, name, uh, we have 33 taxa in the alignment. That's correct. We had 34 at the beginning, and we removed uh, white pseudo. And we have about uh, 15,000 sites in the SNP alignments. And the rest, we don't really have to care at this stage. So let me know when you're done with that. Okay, once this is done, you go to the tip date tab and you click on this little box here, use tip dates. So we're going to use the sample ages to calibrate the tree. And to do so, so I, I think you have to click on this auto configure button, or maybe not. Ah, oh, yeah. So auto configure and then read from file and then you browse and you should have the sample age.txt file here, which you open and that's it. We click on OK and now you should have uh, values in those, uh, like non-zero values in those columns on the right. So please let me know again if you're done with that part. Okay, cool. So what we need to do now, and we should not forget, is that the actually the this this uh, ages that we have they are in years before present. So we should uh, tell that to beauty basically, and change since sometime in the past. That would be the case if you have if you had a date, for instance, to before the present. And that should basically change uh, the values on the right. So don't forget to do that. Maybe. Okay, I'm just gonna back, go back to the, that slide. 
And for those of you who are a bit familiar with those things already, I will leave you maybe, I don't know, two, three minutes to try setting up the, the analysis yourself. And then I will go through the through the set through the setup on duty with you for those of you who can't figure it out. Um, I can't, um, I don't find how to change the mean clock. The, the clock model? Yeah. Okay, so that's, I can show you. So you have to go in the clock model tab. Yeah. And then change this strict clock to relaxed clock, log normal. Yeah. And then, yeah, it's not so easy, actually, if you don't know. But so this is the initial value that will be used. Mm -hmm. And we'll change that to 10 to the minus 4. So 1e minus 4 means 10, 10 to the minus 4. Thank you. So is anyone done with that?
I have another question just to make sure I'm doing it correctly. Uh, on yeah. the MCMC tab, yes. is it the first chain link that should be 300 million? And Indeed. is it the store yeah. every parameter that should be 10,000? The chain length is the number of iterations, so the number of steps for the MCMC chain. So that should be changed to 200 million. And then the log every gives you the frequency of same thing. So we change that to 10,000 in the trace log and also in the, in the mostly in the tree log, actually. Yeah, that's not so straightforward if you don't know it in advance. But okay, I, sit, I think I'll go to, through all the steps now. So I hope everyone could upload the data and the dates correctly. And so we are now going to choose the site model and we're going to change this JC669 to GTR. And we will use indeed a gamma site model. It's already here. And we will choose four gamma categories. So this gamma site model, just for you to know, is a way to account for variability in the mutation rates depending on the nucleotide position. When this is done, you go to the clock model tab. You change, as I did, strict clock to relaxed clock, clock normal. And then you change the initial value of the clock rate to 1 e minus 4 like that, which means 10 to the minus 4. Once this is done, you go to the priors and you will change the tree prior here, which is initially a Yule model by default to a coalescent Bayesian skyline. And then the only other thing I want you to change is the prior distribution of this UCLD mean. Yeah, that's actually <laughs> difficult to guess. That's actually the, the clock rate. And for this one, we want to use a uniform distribution indeed, but not between zero and infinity, rather between 10 to the minus six and 10 to the minus 3. So this is a range of value for the mutation rates in number of mutations per, un per time units. Yeah. All right. That we are pretty confident based on prior knowledge that the true mutation rate is, is uh, facing it. And then in the MCMC tab, you change the chain length to 300 millions which means that we run the, the MCMC for 300 million steps. And then you change the trace log, which is the frequency at which the MCMC will sample these parameters to 10,000. So it will sample the parameters every 10,000 steps. And this is actually only for monodimensional parameters, so like the substitution rates and the, the clock rate. And then you have another log file for the trees themselves in the bottom. You can click on this arrow and you are gonna change that number to 10,000 also. And everything else you can uh, leave the same. And then you're gonna save that analysis by clicking on file save us and you can you can call it let's say beast analysis 
dot xml or input yeah. okay once this is done close beauty and run the analysis by typing simply beast and your input.xml file. Yeah. And so now you can see that the analysis is running and you have the number of steps uh, that the MCMC has uh, gone through and also the speed of the analysis. So in, it, in, this take, in this case, it takes four minutes per million samples. So basically we won't have the time to reach the 300 million samples that we have uh, asked for. But the good thing is we, we can already look at the results even if it's not uh, finished. Okay, so could everyone uh, do that? Who is actually running uh, at the moment the beast analysis? Okay, so the prior tab, I'm going to show you again. Okay. Yeah, so Maria probably you inverted the two values, I guess. Or you didn't type them correctly. So the lower values should be one, 10 to the minus six, and the other values should be 10 to the minus three. So this is the prior step again. And maybe you see more things because you unfolded some of those uh, things. The only thing you should change is what is in the trip prior. You should change, in, change it from a Yule model to a coalescent Bayesian skyline. And then these values in the uniform distribution for the mean clock rate. Ah, that's possible. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I did a mistake. But I should, should run also with that model. Okay. Yes, yeah, so Aida is telling me that if you couldn't prepare the XML file correctly, there's actually one that, that was already prepared in a folder that is called intermediate files in the working folder. So I think she's gonna copy the, the path to that file and you can just run the, the beast uh, analysis on that file if you didn't do so already. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Uh, so I don't think we'll have the time to actually go through all the steps uh, at the end. So I'll go quickly over what you should be doing. And, and then you can try it at home uh, on, those, uh, on those files. So basically, uh, once you've run your uh, beast analysis, what you should check first is whether the MC, uh, MCMC robot has worked uh, long enough. And to do, so, to do so, we will use what we call trace plots that we will uh, visualize using tracer that allow to show the values of the parameters and of the posteriors along the MCMC chain. And what you should observe in general first, when you look at the trace plot of the posterior probability, is that the MC, MC robot started at, with random parameter values. So usually it should be pretty far away from this, uh, from this hill where you have the, the highest value of the posterior. And so there is a first period in which it will uh, basically climb this hill before it reaches the top and then kind of like oscillates around the top of this hill. And so this first part of the analysis, we kind of want to get rid of it. This is what we call the burning phase. And so the first thing that you sh uh, should uh, basically check is that you have passed uh, this burning phase and remove uh, those first uh, samples from your analysis. And I, that's, that's something I'm, I'm gonna show you quickly how to do. The second thing that you should check once you have passed the burning phase is whether the robot has worked long enough. And for that, we will compute for each parameter uh, quantity that we call the effective sampling size, which is basically a measure of the number of uncorrelated samples that the MC, MC robot that has um, uh, collected. And a typical rule of thumb is that this value should be over 200 uh, to consider the, the estimates kind of robust. So usually if you have a trace plot for your parameter that looks a bit like that, irregular, that means uh, the analysis has not run long enough and you will usually have low ESS values. And when it has uh, run long enough, you should have something that looks more like that. And this is the typical hairy cat caterpillar that we are always looking for when we're doing Bayesian uh, analysis. And when you have that, it's pretty sure that your, uh, the ESS value of your parameter should be over uh, 200. Okay. So that's the thing. Those are just the diagnostics uh, tools to assess that the MCMC has run correctly. And once it's the case, you can use uh, basically those uh, sample parameters value that are represented by this trace plot to approximate the posterior probability of the parameter and from that you can derive different things like the mean estimate the median estimate and uh, the confidence interval and that's also something something you can do in tracer and so we'll do that uh, now open tracer and import trace file. So where is volume? Yeah, okay. yeah. And then so this is the no, or is it? Yeah, this is the output of the the beast analysis that I'm running. But I know that it's not complete, so I'm going to go directly into the intermediate files folder, in which we already have a nice uh, completed analysis. So I open this log file, I open it, and here 
you have a table with the posterior distribution values and the different uh, parameters and different tabs on the right. One of these tabs is uh, the trace. So I will look at the trace of the posterior. And in this case, I can see first that we are over the burning phase. Largely, we cannot even see it. It was really at the beginning, the, the posterior value was uh, climbing, climbing. And also that, yeah, the trace indeed looks re really much like a, a hairy caterpillar. So this means that uh, basically the analysis has uh, run long enough. Also, you can see the ESS values for all your parameters in this column, and you can see that they are all above uh, 200. If it's not the case, that should be indicated in red, actually. So here, uh, yeah, we can see that the analysis has completed. There is also an estimates uh, tab, which uh, gives you the different mean, median, and uh, interval estimates for each of the parameters. So for instance, I can look at UCLD mean, which is uh, the mutation rate, and you can see that my mean estimate for that parameter is seven times 10 to the minus six substitutions per year, basically. And this here is a representation of the posterior distribution of that uh, parameter. And for instance, you can look at this uh, HPD interval, which kind of gives you the, the uncertainty we have on that parameter. So we are pretty sure that it's between four times 10 to the minus six and uh, 10 to the minus, minus five, basically. Okay, so this is uh, how you look at the results for the monodimensional parameters. And now I'm gonna quickly show you how to look at the trees. Um, so yes, I'm gonna pass that quickly, but basically to summarize, so it's pretty easy to summarize the posterior distribution of uh, a monodimensional parameter because you can compute the mean or median, for instance, but for trees, it's much more uh, difficult. And so we have to use a special technique, which we call in this case, the maximum clade credibility tree. And which is basically that, so you're looking at your sample of trees and for each clade in this sample, you will compute the proportion of the sample trees that contain this clade. So this is something that is a bit analog to this uh, bootstrap report that I was uh, telling you uh, before. And then the tree that you will select as a point estimate for your posterior distribution is the one that maximizes the product of those uh, posterior supports, basically. And it, it is called the MCC tree for maximum clade credibility tree. And that's something you can build using a program called tree annotator. So using uh, this command line here, which I'm gonna run quickly. Okay, so it's done. 
and now I can visualize it with Figtree as usual. This one, okay. So you can see that now you, we have a time tree with branches in, in uh, time units that based on a time axis that you can actually add in fig tree. It's a reverse axis in this case because it's years before present. And so we have all the modern genomes that based on this uh, zero line here. And you can also add, for instance, the support, the posterior support of the plates at your nodes. And so using this time tree, you can uh, uh, answer questions such as, uh, what was the date of the most common ancestor of the full Y-Petis diversity, which is this node here, and seems to place around 6,000 years ago, based on that analysis. For instance. Okay, I'm sorry that was a bit rushed at the end. Uh, I hope you can still do that using those slides and what you've uh, started to do during the practical. There are a few points that we could not cover because of time. One is uh, temporal signal testing. So that's something you should usually do before trying uh, a, a a beast analysis. So before trying to construct the time tree, you can look at the slides to see how it works and try it with uh, a program that is called Tempest that is also installed on the virtual machine. And uh, yeah, that's it basically. I think I will pass the outlook and have a look at it. With, we wanted to touch a bit on how to deal with missing data, recombination, genetic recombination, and also tell you that phylogenies can tell you much more than just evolutionary relationship. If you want to do phylogeography or phylo uh, dynamics that can allow you to estimate uh, ancient uh, pathogen dissemination or uh, ancient epidemiological parameters, things like that. So yes, there is much more uh, to do that we can cover in two hours, of course. And yeah. Here are a few uh, good reads and our email addresses if you have uh, questions. And thank you again for attending. I hope you enjoyed, although it was a bit dense. And uh, I will see some of you at the dinner tonight, I guess. <laughs>